Okay, for those of you just joining the program, we're going to wait a few seconds for everybody to file into the virtual classroom and give Chuck Steele a chance to get his light working right there in front of him so we can see his uh, handsome face. Um, we really got him for his looks and not his intellect in, the, in this program. So um, we'll give it about sure. another few seconds and then we'll start the program. Getting shortchanged all the way around then for that, Clay. <laughs> That's right. I'm not getting my money's worth on this one. Hell no. Okay. And um, okay, we'll go ahead and start things off. Um, for those of you just joining us, there'll be some more coming in. Uh, over the next 30 seconds or so. Uh, welcome to another edition of Popcorn Thursday here at the Virginia War Memorial. I'm Clay Mountcastle. I'm the director at the Virginia War Memorial. And um, on Thursdays, uh, one Thursday night every month, we like to have a little fun with military history and bring in some uh, experts, some historians, and uh, get, uh, get involved with some of those questions that <clears throat> historians kind of bat, uh, bat back and forth a lot either in the hallway, in the classroom, in the teacher's lounge or something like that. Uh, it's one of those things where nothing truly gets decided, but everybody uh, likes to give their opinion and their thoughts on certain things. Um, <clears throat> so today's topic, uh, well, today's title program is what the, the dumbest decisions in military history. Now we understand that this is a program that could probably take up about five, six or seven hours if we wanted to, but we're gonna shoot for a, sh a shorter time than that. Uh, about an hour. Um, I was very lucky to um, be able to bring in uh, a couple of, of true experts in this area. Um, we've got Professor Wayne Shaw from the, the U.S. Naval Academy out in Annapolis, and we have Professor Chuck Steele, uh, who teaches at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, but is currently suffering out in Hawaii on the Big Island. I know Air Force making him do tough things out there in, in Hawaii. We feel sorry for him, but we're glad that he can join us for, for a brief break from that tough work that he's doing. So um, we appreciate uh, Wayne and Chuck joining us. And <clears throat> really the way this is gonna go tonight is we are all gonna share our opinions on the dumbest decisions in military history. And I've divided each round of discussion up into the measure of dumb, dumber and dumbest. So each of us will kind of chime in uh, on that round of discussion and talk about uh, some examples that they think are the dumbest decisions in military history. Talk a little bit about why they chose those examples. For those of you watching the program, I encourage you to go ahead and put any comments in the chat feature that you would like to. Uh, you can chat along with us. Uh, feel free to type in any questions for any of the panelists and we'll look at those towards the end of the program. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and start our Popcorn Thursday, what the, the dumbest decisions in military history. Wayne, Chuck, thank, uh, thanks again for joining us for this. And I'm gonna go ahead and start things off with our round of dumb, uh, a round of dumb decisions. Um, Chuck, let's go ahead and start with you. Why don't you get us going on, um, on one of your dumb decisions? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, hey, first things, I, I, because I do work for, for the Air Force uh, or the Air Force Academy, just a, a, a disclaimer to anybody who's, who's taking notes out there or scoring at home. Uh, the opinions I'm about to express are, are my own uh, and, and don't reflect those of the Air Force Academy, the Air Force or the Department of Defense. So just uh, just making sure that I'm, I'm, I'm covered there legally. Um, so my, my, my dumb thing, I'll start uh, at, at the tactical level of war. And uh, I, my, myself and one of my colleagues, we just uh, completed work on editing a book uh, that's, that became available on the 22nd of this month. Uh, on, on history's worst military leaders. Um, I chose David Beatty for my chapter. And uh, I think at the tactical level, uh, you know, his, his performance definitely would, would, would go into the, the, the dumb round. Uh, uh, he had a tremendous advantage uh, in firepower over, over Hipper and his, his battle cruisers, uh, but he was so anxious to, to, to come to grips uh, with his opponent for after after having fought in, in a couple of battles already uh, and and not receiving or, or not actually producing a, a truly decisive result. Uh, he didn't want to let Hipper go. He gave up the advantages that he had in in the range of his guns. Uh, I mean, he, he had a massive advantage. 
uh, but but chose to to close the distance and then very very quickly lost uh, two of his most modern ships. Two of his battle cruisers uh, were were basically blown up and and uh, you know I would say that that was a really rash decision on Beatty's part that led to those two those those two disasters. Uh, Winston Churchill, after it was all over and done with, you know, would say that uh, Jellicoe was the only man who could have lost the war in a day. But um, I think it was David Beatty and his tactical ineptitude or his his dumbness uh, that that came the closest to, to producing that result. And Chuck, for those out in the audience that might not be all that familiar with Jutland and those things, what in, in the big picture of World War One, the significance of Jutland and all that in the big picture of the war? Yeah, so I mean, I I I think you could make a, an argument. It's the second most consequential battle in the war. Uh, I would I would place it right after the the first Battle of the Marne, the Miracle on the Marne. But in 1916, there are really four major engagements. Uh, the, the Germans start uh, the, the the year uh, in February of 1916, uh, trying to produce a campaign of attrition at Verdun. Uh, to bleed France white. And so that's that's the big German effort. It does suck up a lot of French resources. Uh, the British then are, are prompted to, to, to counter and, and that leads to, to the Battle of the Somme to try and take pressure off the French, which, which succeeds. Uh, the Russians uh, launched the Brazil of offensive. So in 1916, a whole lot of really uh, bloody events uh, Jutland, in comparison, which is May 31st to June 1st of 1916, is the, the, the biggest naval engagement of the war. Uh, in comparison to those events, uh, far less bloody. Uh, you know, British casualties are about, you know, in that, in that period, about one-tenth of what they are on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. Uh, but I would argue it's, it's the second most consequential engagement of, of the First World War. Uh, because even though the Germans, a lot of Germans like to, to claim it as a tactical success because of, of the losses that they inflicted on the British, it was almost you know, twice as, or rather, rather you know, in terms of ships and, and personnel, about you know, two to one. Um, but the, the, the net result is that the British succeed in driving the Germans off the sea. Um, Scheer, who commands the German high seas fleet, is is going to have to go back and say that you know we can't break the blockade this way we can't stand up to, to British supremacy on the surface uh, and so the Germans will return to unrestricted submarine warfare in 1917 and that has disastrous consequences uh, in that the Germans are going to gamble as a strategic gamble so this could go at the next you know or, or two levels up uh, that the United States, uh, would not be able to field a large enough army or a, a good enough army to, to turn events in the war uh, before the Germans could use submarines to drive the British out. They're wrong on, on both accounts, but Jutland is as an event, uh, as that one naval engagement, despite the fact that casualties don't resemble those of the land engagements, I think is far more consequential. Uh, but Beatty, for his part in this, he, the, 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 the British Grand Fleet uh, there was the battle fleet, which contained the the battleships, uh, and then Beatty had a force of battle cruisers, which displaced about as much, but they were faster, more lightly armored, uh, but better armed ships. They didn't have as much defensive armor, um, but Beatty suffers these 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 bad losses, um, even though Jellico uh, had at one point warned him of exactly the kind of engagement. But if you if you read my chapter in the book, you can get this in detail. But the the point I'm just trying to get at is that uh, Beatty really screws up big and and puts the British in a bad situation, um, you know. And and you know, the fact that Jellicoe manages to save the situation despite Beatty's ineptitude leads us on to the you know the retreat from from trying to to win the the war at sea uh, on the surface to then trying to go subsurface and that brings us in. All right, good good roundup. Very nicely done. All right, Wayne, how about you? Yeah, so uh, th thanks, thanks, Clay, uh, uh, for, for inviting me here. Thanks to, to Chuck for, for um, you know, 
for everyone for, for in the Virginia War Memorial. Uh, I also need to give the customary JAG a disclaimer. Nothing I say here is an official opinion in any way, shape, or form of my employer, which is the United States Naval Academy. Uh, so with, with that out of the way, if, if the JAG or PAO is listening, hi. Uh, but um, I, I, uh, I am actually, just to be clear with everyone, I am actually really a, a 19th century American military historian, but I'm going to give actually some examples outside of a normal field of expertise, uh, just because um, um, uh, maybe because I'm just tired of talking about Stonewall Jackson and stuff like that, right? So, um, so I am going to be a little unconventional, and I will give actually uh, as the as sort of the tactical level dumb, uh, uh, the uh, and it, but partly because it's in the news, but but I'll nominate. Uh, and with all the caveats, this is very fragmentary right now because it's sort of literally history in the making. Uh, what seems to have been this rushing air assault uh, on the on Hostomel, the airport in Hostomel's attempt to seize that airfield um, and then you to use it as an airhead uh, to basically run, uh, you know, basically what seems to be VDV sort of rushing airborne troops as kind of a coup de main on, on Kiev, the, the Ukrainian capital. Um, which it seems to have been uh, a catastrophic failure, right? Uh, seems to be the, the Russians, uh, we have historical lessons about how very risky air assault missions are, uh, um, you know, from World War II especially, they're reason these, these are generally not, in, uh, not attempted a lot of times. Um, from what we know, the, the Russians did not establish air superiority. Uh, they did not. Um, uh, they did not have uh, basically the assets that they needed to to actually flow in there and to be successful. Um, and I think this is a kind of an interesting example of of where the tactical level intersects with other levels of war, so to speak. I mean, some of this seems to have been a strategic misjudgment of of kind of the Ukrainians' willingness to resist. Um, but also uh, that initial failure is, is arguably seems to have larger strategic effects on basically meaning that, that, uh, that the, the Russian government is not going to be able to sort of win a very quick victory uh, at the outset of the war with kind of this bold initial stroke, um, which in the end was, was uh, what seems to have been much too risky um, for, uh, and, and, and too costly. So that's, that's the kind of a tactical thing that I, I will nominate. All right, good. Well, I'm glad you said it. Because I think that's that's one of the yeah that's obviously the elephant in the room here right now. It's just like wow, we see some very questionable decision making playing out every night on the news. And I, I, certainly, we could do a Russian slash Soviet bad decision episode of of this whole thing. Uh, I think, and we'd have plenty to talk about. Um, well, good um, for my dumb level of decision. I'm going to go with a little bit of uh, geo. Geographical bias, uh, not too far from where I'm sitting right now, uh, 1864, July, 30th of July, 1864, the Battle of the Crater uh, in the Civil War. For those that aren't terribly familiar, here's the scene. You have uh, uh, Robert E. Lee's army um, uh, conducting a defense around Petersburg, trying to keep um, the Army of the Potomac and um, Ulysses S. Grant from capturing the important rail hub of Petersburg, which certainly would have spelled doom for the capital of Richmond and, and all those things. So um, defending around Petersburg and, and the Union Army keeps trying to find that weak point in the defense and trying to get a breakthrough in, in an assault. And so um, this one assault happening on the 30th of July, the lead up actually begins many weeks earlier when the 48th Pennsylvania Infantry begins to tunnel uh, underneath the Confederate line of defenses to dig directly underneath and pack that tunnel full of explosives. And then they were plan was to blow up basically the Confederate defensive line and then assault through the breach. And there's your breach and go ahead and assault that. So, okay, in theory, sounds like a good plan. Um, seems like, it, and the tunneling goes actually quite well. You know, the, the, the old, the coal miners from Pennsylvania do their job. They know what they're doing and they dig right underneath uh, the Confederate lines, even though the Confederates can kind of hear things going on, they're not exactly sure what, and um, they're doing countermining and all these things. So uh, the scene is set the day before this assault and everything is going to happen. And then we start to see this flurry of bad decisions happening. Starting up at the top, uh, the technical commander of the Army or the Army of the Potomac, George Meade, decides that the, um, the division that was planned to lead the assault after the explosion, actually consisting of a large number of US colored troops um, and was very fully manned. It was one of the few 
uh, divisions that was had almost all of its troops at that point <clears throat> and had been training for such a mission, um, he decides that he does not want this uh, uh, unit to lead the charge for political reasons. He did not want to lose a large contingent of U.S. colored troops right off the bat, fearing of what that might look like. So he's worried about the politics of it. And so he tells uh, General Ambrose Burnside that, hey, you got to switch it out, put somebody else in there. I don't want them leading it. So in his infinite wisdom, Andrews Burr's side, does he just turn to his most competent, capable subordinate and say, now you're, no, 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 he brings three um, commanders together and says, okay, draw straws, draw straws, you know, put them all together. And let's, that's a wonderful way to choose who's going to lead this all important assault to try and break through the Confederate lines. Um, yeah, go ahead and draw straws and luck would have it. Um, that the worst guy possible to lose or win that draw straw, James Ledley, and I've complained about him before in our programs before, he was actually my worst general ever in American military history. James Ledley draws the short straw, and he then has to lead the attack into the assault after the explosion, and <clears throat> things just go from bad to worse. The actual explosion happens very early in the morning on July 30th, and um, the assault does happen, but James Ledley being uh, the kind of guy he is, he is not part of the assault. No, no, no. He retreated very far to the rear. And as uh, esteemed uh, historian, uh, Civil War historian Edwin Bears said, caressed a bottle of rum. And um, so he just proceeded to get drunk um, while this was going on. And meanwhile, the Union soldiers are not charging in and around this new crater. They are morbidly fascinated. They charge right into the crater. And now they find themselves fighting to get out of this human uh, mixture of death and blood and terrible things. And the Confederate uh, Army is able to counterattack Billy Mahone and those guys. It ends up being a tragic defeat for the Union Army. And it's just because of a cascade of very bad decisions, pull out that one division, put in some other guys, draw straws. Okay, you guys go, but I'm gonna stay back here and get loaded. And the other guys like, even at the individual soldier level, let's run up there, hey, let's go charge them down into the hole that was just created in the ground. That's a great battle position to be in. So um, bad decisions on just about every level. And it, it was a very costly defeat for, um, for the Army of the Potomac, it basically meant that they wouldn't be able to try such a thing again for another nine months around Petersburg. And you can imagine how many soldiers died on either side in the course of that nine months, just waiting to be able to do it again. So it certainly prolonged the American Civil War, at least in, in the Eastern Theater. So there we go, um, wrapping up our, our dumb level of decision-making. So- May I just add one quick thing? Uh, yeah, go ahead. That was a great summary. I just also add for those who do, don't know, the irony or the bitter irony really is that lots of USCT troops are then committed later mm -hmm. into the battle. So yeah. you do end up having large numbers of African-American troops who are killed uh, uh, after this uh, sort of all goes south. So, you know, the, the whole, I mean, this is just one element of that kind of chain of, of incredibly bad. Uh, you know, and also, I mean, I'll just point out things like why is Ambrose Burnside still <laughs> in charge of an army corps at this point in the war. I mean, it's just kind of one of these mystifying, uh, uh, you know, mysterious things right. uh, that that is also sort of, you know, hovering all over over that yeah. sort of unfortunate. I guess, I guess Frederick Bird wasn't bad enough. The mud march and all that stuff wasn't bad enough. I mean, let's, let's keep recycling these dudes, you know. So um, there we go. Okay. Uh, proceeding along, getting even uh, deeper down the, the well of stupidity. Um, as we go here, let me see if I can't advance my dumb slide. Now I'm the dumb one because, okay, there we go. And there you have it, the Davy Crockett uh, nuclear mortar system or whatever the, the actual nomenclature was. That's just a dumb weapon system. So I just wanted to put that, uh, that picture on there. I'm not going to talk about the Davy Crockett myself, but you have to think that anything that houses a type of nuclear munition on the end of a, what you call a short range uh, delivery system probably doesn't make that much sense. Luckily, it was never actually used in, in the field. So with that, let, uh, let's mix it up a little bit. Wayne, let's go to you for your, your dumber. 
Yeah, sure. So uh, I, I'm going to do something recent again. Don't worry. I will. I will fix something very, very old for my last example. Uh, but the 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 sort of I was thinking kind of uh, the operational level, um, and this is kind of sort of the operational level. But I, I and this is definitely where you see me giving the Jack disclaimer. I would nominate as my dumber decision. Um, and I'm all too serious. I also say this because I think as as an employee of the Department of Defense, I don't think we've we are going to we have fully grappled with what happened in Afghanistan last summer, quite frankly, right? And and the and the one kind of I guess more operational failure I would nominate is uh, whatever one thinks of the strategic rationale of leaving Afghanistan, which which we don't need to debate here, uh, choosing to execute it in a way where and I, I will fixate on one thing, and it's kind of fortunate Chuck you're here as an employee of the Air Force Academy. Uh, I, I will focus on, for example, not making the United, the United States government not making provision for sufficient contractor support for the Afghan Air Force, right? Um, at least my impression is much of the planning for, for allowing the Afghan, the prior Afghan government before it fell to survive was that its ace in the hole would be its air power, things like A-29s, light attack aircraft, rotary aviation. Um, but the United States had essentially built this air force uh, to be completely dependent on American contractors for things like maintenance. Um, and when the decision was made uh, by the administration to, to remove US forces, those contractors, of course, did not wish to remain at places like Bagram Airfield. So, um, and so if you, if you followed up this car of Hall, um, rather uh, unfortunate dismal rung up, um, you had these kind of it quite, I mean, people can Google it if they wish, uh, for example, the fix for this was to have uh, American technicians attempt to train their Afghan counterparts over Zoom. Uh, they were going to be trying to, to give advice. Now, you know, I am a parent during the COVID pandemic. Some of us have taught, unfortunately, online formats. Um, it's obviously challenging enough with, uh, with her academic content. Can you imagine trying to teach an Afghan how to maintain a, a turboprop light attack aircraft over, <laughs> over, over Zoom? And of course, it didn't work. Um, and, and no one should be surprised it didn't work. Um, and they kind of, um, uh, you know, there, there were obviously sort of extremely foreseeable flaws. I'm, I'm sort of deliberately avoiding the whole debate about like, should the United States have left residual Bagram and stuff like that. I'm actually picking something a little bit off, off, off that kind of somewhat politicized debate. Uh, but this is, you know, and this is arguably one of many uh, missteps, uh, you know, the United States had in, in Afghanistan, you know, over decades. And, and, and I'm just going to highlight this one that, that helped then lead to kind of the, the collapse of of, of the Afghan National Army and, and all the things that subsequently happened last summer. Yeah, I, I know, it. I think it will be fascinating when somebody can, can put the last, mm, say two or three years into some type of uh, coherent explanation as to what was expected, what was hoped for, what were, what were the communication going on. And I thought of it in terms of, a lot of us are very familiar with H.R. McMaster's great work, you know, you know, dereliction of duty, LBJ, the Joint Chiefs, and the lies that led to Vietnam. I thought of it as in reverse, kind of like a book on the inside workings of getting out of Afghanistan and what type of conversations were going on and what who was actually saying what. Um, I, I just I hope that, you know, before too long, we hopefully don't have to wait 20 years. Uh, to get a, a book like that, but I would love to be able to kind of know what was said, what was hoped for, what the real plan was, and if, if there truly was a, a, a real plan or just wishful thinking with certain aspects of it. So I, I, it's, I, I find it very, very intriguing. And, and yeah, we don't, we don't go into the who's to blame game necessarily. Uh, I, my disclaimer is that, you know, we're a, 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 a memorial and education center and um, and we we do a lot of different things involving military history, but we try not to get too much into the uh, political debate about things uh, as best we can. But I still think, in terms of military history, in a chapter in our military history, I think the you know the the last five years in Afghanistan, even though we didn't see things like Anaconda or or even some of the you know Talfar and all those things, I still think it will be very interesting to read about later on as to how it all played out and who was making the decisions. So with that, 
uh, my little blurb on the back of your book. Um, let's go to let's go to Chuck. Um, yeah, so I would go uh, f- farther back. Obviously, I, I'm thinking in World War One. If we're as, as per our conversation earlier, I guess um, you know we had talked about looking at, at the three levels of war. So starting off at the base level with uh, you know, a tactical event and tactical level decisions as being dumb um, to, to take that up to, to the next higher level and, and think about things operationally. Um, you know, I, th- there were three things that came to mind fairly quickly and, and they all were, were in 19, or I don't know, two, two were in 1916. Um, you know, the German decision to initiate a, a campaign of attrition at Verdun uh, without really knowing how to do that, um, the the British decision to try and stop that at the Somme to to attack on a broader front, uh, which you know, and using a massive amount of artillery that, of course, then was spread out over a broader front, so uh, reducing its its effectiveness. I think the operational level decisions for how those two campaigns were to be initiated, uh, obviously, they have invited books. Uh, and so those, those, those would have been big ones. Uh, but I also, uh, you know, speaking about air power and other things, one of the chapters in our book uh, is about Lewis Brereton, who I know is not responsible for the operational level planning. He has a role to play as a commander of the Air Army that's, that's supporting it. Uh, but Operation Market Garden, I think, would be the, the operational lever, you know, uh, pardon me, operational level dumber uh, event. Uh, and that they're so complex. And you know, Wayne was talking about, you know, in, in this day and age, even beyond this point, uh, you know, how problematic these things are. But imagine dropping three divisions uh, to, to capture a series of bridges, discounting intelligence of, of you know, increased enemy activity to, to include, you know, not light troops, but heavy troops, uh, and, and still going forward, this thing, uh, nothing keeps to the time schedule. Uh, it, it's, you know, ultimately it's a disaster for the most inexperienced troops, which were the British paratroopers who had been dropped uh, at Arnhem. Uh, and it, I mean, it, it just really from, from, the, from concept to execution uh, is, 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 is a study in, uh, you know, I, I've used the word ineptitude before, but I'll use it again because it's just, it's, it's, it's a bad event. And it's 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 shame, you know, that so many brave people fought and died because there's a lot of 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 heroism that that you can track through this at the tactical level, uh, but but the commanders, the generals, in particular Montgomery uh, and Browning, the, the the people who put this thing together, really failed the people beneath them, uh, who then had to execute this. So I would I would put Operation Market Garden uh at, at the top of my dumber list or or you know operational level bad things i've always thought that um montgomery and other people have been kind of let off the hook by historians and stuff because you know it, it's just the when you look at the big scope of world war ii it's like well yeah market garden didn't go the way they wanted to but but things got kind of turned around and you know battle of the bulge they got it back and and I just think that uh, because World War II was the scope that it was, so many large scale operations that when really bad decisions were made and, and things went poorly in a lot of ways, there were things that happened later on that seemed to kind of, well, we made up for it. And, some, and I think a lot of historians have tended to kind of like, maybe not to gloss over, and certainly the, the, the focused operational level World War II historian does not. But, you know, kind of the, the folks like me that tend to like, you know, kind of hit the surface on a lot of these things and all that kind of say, oh, you know. I, I think, you know, Montgomery in, in some ways, it's, it's kind of like what happens with Halsey. I mean, Montgomery has a, a good 1942. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Halsey has a good 1942. Uh, he has an absolutely horrific 1944. Uh, if one looks at Leyte, you know, if one looks at Leyte and at you know, his chasing, you know, his chasing Ozawa and the empty carriers uh, and, and, you know, setting up Samar to, to, to be a disaster, which it's not, uh, which, you know, for, you know, on the naval side, not to, to steal Wayne's, you know, uh, Wayne's, Wayne's thing for, for his school, but, 
you know, one of the most improbable and amazing victories at the tactical level ever. Uh, you know, uh, I love Horn Fisher's book, The Last Stand of the Tin Can Sailors. I've got my, my cadets are reading that right now. It's spring break for us. So when they come back, we're going to have a discussion about this. Um, but I mean, Halsey left, you know, Halsey left Seventh Fleet in a really bad position, especially the three taffy groups that are there off Samar. And, you know, a couple months later in December, he sails into a, a, a typhoon, an absolutely horrific typhoon, loses three destroyers. Uh, you know, 700 plus sailors die from, uh, from, from that. Um, and, you know, and he's the guy who gets the, the last fifth star amongst the admirals, not Spruance, who I think had a much better record, uh, but, but Halsey. So, I mean, you know, when you talk about Montgomery escaping criticism, you know, I think he became a, a hero at a time when, when the British absolutely needed a hero in the same sense that Halsey becomes a hero at a time when the United States needs a hero. Uh, and then they both have horrific 1944s, uh, but at that point, you know, the war is just, you know, uh, it's a short way to the end, and and nobody's going to tarnish their heroes. But that is probably a conversation for a, for for a different panel, uh, you know, uh, unworthy icons or something like that. You know, you could talk about, you know, M MacArthur and his defense of the Philippines, or or Halsey, like I said, or these other guys. But I do think Montgomery, you know, gets the pass for what he had done earlier in the war, especially what he does in 42. All right, great. All right, well, for my dumber, I'm going big picture. And, um, and I kind of tipped my hat a little bit earlier because I mentioned H.R. McMaster's book. Um, it, it's, it's kind of a, I don't want to say it's low hanging fruit, but to talk about the decision to go to war in Vietnam, you know, it was controversial then, it's be stayed controversial. It is one of those historical uh, debates that I don't think will ever be answered completely to anybody's satisfaction as to like everybody agrees. Um, the, the decision to 19, or, um, 1964, 1965 to commit to Operation Rolling Thunder and the bombing of Northern Vietnam, sustained bombing campaign in Northern Vietnam, and then committing uh, full-on ground troops to Vietnam. And I, I think the reason why, I mean, you could all argue all day long, we do this about every war that we enter, should we or should we not go to war? Um, why did we go there? Was it worth it? Was it the right thing? That happens with every conflict. Um, but when I, not only McMaster's book, but other things, it seems like uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson didn't, want, didn't even want to go into war in Vietnam. He was saying things like, you know, there's, you know, a, a guy will fight if he sees a light at the end of the road, but there's no light at the end in, in Vietnam. And he was saying this very early on. And yet his actions, his decisions, and with aid from, you know, Joint Chiefs and others are kind of pushing things in the opposite direction. And whether it was political pressure, whether it was, you know, what have you, it seems like, we, you know, America did just kind of, you know, Mission Creepers just commit itself to this war in, um, in Asia that one, we didn't sell to the American people because we just kind of slowly increased and then we were there. And then, you know, folks at home, you know, you hear people talk about, well, at first people supported the war in Vietnam was because at first it was kind of like a small thing that was happening slowly, you know, over there and that it wasn't on the news every night and all those things. So, you know, okay, sure. Um, but because once escalation happened and, and the, the body count went up and, you know, more and more, it just seems like it was a very, I don't know, I, I can't come up with the right adjective to describe our kind of sliding into war in Vietnam and committing uh, to rolling thunder and, and troops. And then, and then we're in without really kind of knowing exactly, I don't think, what we were doing and, and you know, trying to support the, the regime, obviously, in South Vietnam, but um, that's a political goal. But militarily, it just, it's always struck me as, you know, maybe I'll get Greg Gaddis on the next one, and he can go off on, on Vietnam and, and the whys and hows and all that. But I think I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention that, because something that is still incredibly controversial today and still has as big a question mark, I think, today as it ever has, I think can certainly be argued to be a, a not wise decision. Am I on solid ground there, Chuck? I, I got to be careful, man. You know, there's a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people in Air Force circles that, uh, 
well, uh, have 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 a very interesting take on 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 Vietnam and how things might have been different. So I'm just I'm I, I'm just going to say, yeah, you're right. Yeah, get Greg on the show. I'm just going to shut up. Well, the the thing that the thing that's been a, a pleasure for me to learn in this current job I'm in right now. I mean, I'm you know I'm the son of a Vietnam veteran. I've known Vietnam veterans kind of throughout my own short you know military history, but getting to know a lot of them in the past few years in my current job, you come to find out that, you know, the Vietnam veterans opinions on the war are just as varied as people on the complete outside. You know, you have your, your veteran that felt like, you know, every decision that was made was justified and they, they fought the good fight. And it was the right thing to do. And, and it just came out on the wrong end. And, and then you have your Vietnam veteran that felt like it was a, you know, a, a theater of really bad decisions all the way through. And they were just caught up in that. And, and so, yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed get kind of talking to Vietnam vets and getting them to open up a little bit on their own perspectives and thoughts of having participated in a war that a lot of people still can't seem to figure out in a lot of ways. So very cool. All right. So um, whose turn is it? Is it Wayne's turn? I think it's Chuck. I mean, are we uh, are we mixing right. it up? Okay, is it Chuck, is it your turn? Or oh, wait, for dumbest, right? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. So yo, you're right. So we've all done our we've all done our dumber. Okay, man. Yeah. I. So I, I so think... you get to start with the dumbest then, Clay? Sure. You, yes. You haven't that's started what I think yet. So why don't you start with the dumbest? No, we'll I'll, just start, I'll start with the dumbest. I think I think I'm qualified to talk dumbest um, when it comes to things like that. So, again. Um, let me fiddle with my, there we go. So, you know, of course, cause the graphic is so important to the discussion here. Um, so my dumbest decision, um, in military history, I'm going to go very big picture on this. I mean, I, sh there's an operational level of this too, but, um, my dumbest decision was Napoleon Bonaparte's decision in 1806, 1807 to implement the continental system. And for those of you that aren't familiar with it, the continental system was basically economic warfare against Great Britain. It was a blockade um, uh, denying trade and commerce uh, between Great Britain and the rest of Western Europe, uh, France, Spain, and, and Russia, and these other uh, nations that Napoleon was trying to keep in heel. And so, he commits to this, you know, um, decree, this, this system, but the problem with doing that is you have to enforce it if you put it out there. And it's really hard to enforce a blockade when you don't have a Navy um, that, can, that can do that. So Napoleon learns that in order to enforce a blockade without a Navy, you have to conduct land, you know, campaigns and invasions to try and spank whoever is defying your, your decree. So he finds himself in Spain, uh, suffering through what people call the Spanish ulcer, a very long, uh, painful, uh, sapping manpower and resources um, <clears throat> as he's fighting insurgents and guerrillas. Uh, the term guerrilla warfare initiating in, uh, from the Napoleon campaign in Spain. And then perhaps most disastrous is his decision to invade Russia in 1812. Um, and, and that, I mean, I thought about just talking about Napoleon's invasion of Russia in 1812, but I kind of think that without the continental system, he wouldn't have been, you know, on the hook to have to do all this. So he invades Russia in 1812, you know, uh, long slog through Sm Smolensk, Battle of Borodino, finally captures Moscow, the capital, and thinks that's going to do it. But lo and behold, the Russians just burn Moscow and move outside the city. And Napoleon, then you can you can call this an operational decision. Then he sits, he sits and stews in a burned out Moscow, not one, not two, not three, not four weeks, but five or six weeks, waiting for the Russians to you know offer a peace agreement or something like that, uh, to you know come to terms with what he wants. Finally realizes that that ain't happening. And so he tells us what's left of his army. Okay, pack it up, guys. Sorry, we got to head back um, towards, um, you know, uh, Western Europe, France, wherever, they, wherever those guys were from uh, at that time, Prussia or something like that. They've been picked up along the way, conscripted into his army. 
And, um, but of course, the timeline is really bad because he sets off as winter is approaching. And Napoleon's retreat from Moscow, um, the, uh, the Bataan Death March, um, the Western Front in World War I, those are the lessons where when I was teaching, I would not worry about talking about Operation This, Battle That, this and all that. I just tried to paint pictures on how bad things sucked. Um, that was one of those, the human misery of things that that's when I would pull out the, you know, the accounts from soldiers about how bad it just sucked. And so uh, when I talk about the retreat from Moscow, you, you know, all of the talk about soldiers, you know, gnawing on the hindquarters of horses as they were walking by because they're starving and it's so cold, the horses don't even, don't even notice it. And uh, guys, you know, just sitting so close to a fire to get warm that they're burning their own skin because it was so cold. And, and so, um, you know, an army of, of whatever, 600,000 at the beginning ends up being something close to, I forget, 40,000, something just, you know, horrific, horrific um, attrition from his decision to not only invade Russia, stay in Moscow, try and retreat in the dead of winter, but just the decision that put him in that position in the first place, uh, implementing a blockade without a Navy to enforce it. And there you go, Napoleon. And, and he would never be the same, obviously. After, after uh, the Continental System in 1812, Napoleon just ain't what he used to be. And kind of his, his years are numbered. Um, but that's, that's my dumb, you know, you know, for every great, wonderful decision Napoleon made, there were probably two or three bad ones. And that's probably the case for most military leaders out there. All right. And with that, let's go to Chuck. Yeah, I, I, you know, that's so oftentimes I, when we speak of the people who have initiated wars that, uh, you know, so we're working up now from the tactical, the operational to the strategic level, those those tend to be the most consequential uh, decisions. I mean, if you initiate a war and it doesn't turn out the way that you expect, um, you know, uh, go back to, to either World War I or World War II, um, you know, and people thinking that they could uh, achieve rapid victory. Um, and, you know, and I would, I would say probably that, you know, the worst decisions were either, you know, the German, the German decision for war in general that took them into Russia uh, and, and ultimately their defeat, but it also, you know, also a war with the United States and Great Britain. Uh, I think it was in, you know, Weinberg's book about, uh, you know, Hitler, Germany. I'm trying to think which, it was back from the 90s, not the, the massive tome on World War II, but there was one, and I, I think it's Weinberg's book where he was talking about, uh, you know, Hitler had campaigned or Hitler had said in, in 33, give me 12 years and you won't recognize Germany. Uh, <laughs> pardon me. Yeah, he, he was he was he was spot on with that because you know twelve years later, nineteen forty five, the place is flattened. Um, you know, and I think the same thing you know, could be said for the Japanese and 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 their decision to attack the United States. Um, just there's you know there's late in the nineteenth century, early in the twentieth century. I, I I think you know between the Germans and the wars of unification and and the Japanese. And their success, although it was incredibly bloody uh, in the Russo-Japanese War, um, you know, I, I think that uh, some somehow uh, people were struck with the notion that that wars could be waged uh, quickly and decisively. Um, and you know, we stumble through World War One and we don't get that. But then you know, you find yourself at World War Two, um, and I think that the thinking still prevailed that maybe you could fine tune something at the operational level or at the tactical level. The technology made it possible to wage war even more efficiently or more effectively, and these things wouldn't last long. Um, but I'll, you know, I'll say I think you know as far as the you know dumb things or dumbest things, um, I think the, you know the assumption that the United States uh, would somehow accept defeat uh, rapidly uh, at the hands of the Japanese in, in in World War II, I think that might be. You know the worst of, of assumptions, and of course, as a historian, you know you have you have hindsight uh, to, to back you up. But thinking about the the industrial capacity that the United States you know had, and it, it wasn't as if we created the factories. The factories were there; they simply had to be converted. Uh, and I know that's not a simple task, but it's one that actually FDR had 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 pondered. You know, a year before this conflict begins. But I would say that that's 
you know, for, for me, it's the strategic level things, because again, look at Japan at the end of World War II. Um, you know, how many, you know, how many millions of people had to suffer for these horrific decisions? So uh, the consequences for strategic level ineptitude are, are obviously the greatest. Um, and so I would give more weight to that as being, you know, the dumbest of things, uh, because it pretty much, you know, it pretty much destroyed life as anybody had, had, had understood it or, you know, to, to bring yourself to the point where you have to surrender unconditionally uh, to, to avoid further slaughter. Um, you got, you got to be pretty inept to, to put yourself in that position. And so, uh, I would say, you know, any of those access level decisions, but perhaps more than anything else, the Japanese and directly attacking the United States and assuming that, that we wouldn't bend our industry, uh, to, to their destruction, I think was probably, you know, a, a horrible decision. You said from the guy out in Hawaii, that's well, right. yeah, I mean, you know. right. um, well, it reminds me of of all people, um, comedian Richard Pryor. I remember in a in one of his stand up bits, he nor Richard Pryor wasn't normally joking about military history, but all of a sudden in one of his his um, his uh, stand up routines, he just all of a sudden looks at the audience and says, "What were the Japanese thinking when they bombed Pearl Harbor?" He say like, "Oh." Uh, were they thinking like, oh yeah, we'll bomb Pearl Harbor and they'll never F with us again. <laughs> it's just kind of like, exactly. It's like, what, what were they thinking? Um, so, you know, point well, point well taken it, you know, in hindsight 2020, all of that, of course, but you have to wonder, you know, the level of confidence and, you know, the, the, the misplacement uh, of confidence is, is kind of staggering. Um, all right, Wayne, go ahead. So I promised I'd pick something much older. So I'm going to nominate the Sicilian expedition from the Peloponnesian War. So, All right. right. So, uh, so you know, to to uh, I guess to to give some background, um, you know, the Peloponnesian War is in the fifth century BC. It's a sort of epic conflict between the two leading Greek city states, Athens versus Sparta. The war lasts about thirty some odd years. It ends in kind of a, a pretty dismal Athenian defeat, and a big part of that defeat is the Athenians, uh, you know, I mean, the, the war has goes through these different phases, but the Athenians sort of in the middle of this period basically decide, you know, we're fighting Sparta, but we're gonna do this gigantically expensive and resource heavy expedition to Sicily. Now, it, just for everyone to know, Sicily is, is has Greek colonists there. So it's not, um, so I mean, to a certain degree, it kind of sort of has some, some involvement here, but it also really does it in lots of ways. So, um, so there are a lot of other things that go wrong. The Athenians have sort of a, a divided and fractured political leadership between its own different factions. You have Alcibiades, who's kind of this notorious figure who kind of runs into this, uh, I guess the, the Athenian version of a, of a strange, you know, sacrilegious scandal that kind of brings it out. And you have all those, all sorts of things going wrong, but, but, you know, and, uh, I, I would just say, just you know, just to keep things simple, um, the Athenians basically, despite being engaged in a massive conflict with 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 kind of this other very potent power, basically choose to commit the bulk of their resources to what's essentially a side theater, um, and then they then compound their failure with more failure. They then proceed to to reinforce that initial mistake, and and sort of, and eventually, what you what happens is a huge chunk of their navy. Uh, and, a, and a decent sized chunk of their army are, are basically totally wiped out. Um, um, and, and the what if I think for that conflict is that the Athenians actually do survive for another decade. Uh, but, but, uh, but if they hadn't sort of ex burned and expended all those resources there, I mean, it, it might've very well changed the outcome of a larger conflict. Um, and it's, it's uh, and, and this is for me, this is kind of what I would nominate as this kind of strategic uh, dumbest uh, um, uh, uh, kind of error and mistake. So this is this is the one. But I also point out this is, I, I you know the, the 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 things I nominated the first two times are so recent as to which we really don't have a great historical context. Right, obviously we don't know how this Russian Ukraine thing is going to really play out. Um, we 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 obviously will need more time and perspective to kind of figure out what happened in Afghanistan last summer. Um, I think in the case of the Peloponnesian War, um, the problem is we only have really one book <laughs> from my author. Um, I mean, there, I mean that's, that's an exaggeration. That's not completely true. There's Plutarch and other things like that. But really, in the ancient world, for ancient history, the source base is much less. So there's, there's always 
a certain amount of uncertainty and, and kind of um, we're just making the best judgments that we can. But this is the kind of, this is the sort of the pre-modern counterpart to this stuff that's sort of hyper-modern for lack of a better term. Great, well, I'm glad we're recording this because I'm gonna market this as Thucydides in five minutes uh, by, by Wayne. So yeah, don't read the, don't read the a thousand page book, you know, just, you know, check in with Wayne a little bit. He'll, he'll break it down for you. And, and in all honesty, I hope my advisor's not listening. I didn't read Thucydides. I, I, I did as, I did as many summary uh, articles as I possibly could get my hands on. I don't think anybody truly reads every page of Thucydides except Cliff Rogers. Um, Cliff, I hope you're, I hope you're out there wherever you are, buddy. <laughs> Um, um, all right. Well, you know what? I'm going to dive into the chat here real quick. Um, um, let me go on up to the top. Okay. Um, Layson. Oh, Layson is on. Hey, Layson, how are you? She says she's digging it. That's great. I appreciate it. Layson is fantastic. She's one of our partners here in Richmond, and she's a, an amazing artist and has a lot of interesting uh, talents of her own. So I'm glad she's tuning in. All right, Rick. All right, Rick Curtin, our, our, our uh, Huey Aviator in Vietnam. Uh, oh, he's talking about specifically Operation Peace Arrow initiated on August of 5th of 1864, 60,000 US KIA and MIA, perhaps another two to three million military and civilian deaths in Southeast Asia. Two to three million civilian deaths uh, when the Khmer Rouge took over Cambodia. Rick, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, I, I can certainly say that, um, and it's, you know, it's by no fault of, of anybody, um, uh, Maybe there was a period in, in the, I don't know, maybe the 80s, maybe the 90s, where uh, professional military education focused an appropriate amount of attention on Vietnam, maybe not. But certainly, I think that already, whether it's PME or certainly in the civilian world, unless you, I mean, Vietnam, in my mind, is such a you know, complex, um, uh, they all are, but it's such a complex um, war that I, I don't, I, 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 I don't know what I'm trying to say. I, I don't think I have much um, hope that um, it's ever going to get the right amount of attention and um, kind of the same spotlight that it, the other wars, even the our more current wars. I mean, more people will probably going into the future try and answer questions about Afghanistan and Iraq than you know continue to try and wrestle with the the big questions of of Vietnam. And that made no sense what I just said for the last three minutes, but it's, hey, that's in line with my understanding of Vietnam. It's, it's very complicated. All right, Mike Santoro, old Marine uh, out there, maybe a subset of your discussion on the Japanese, Chuck, but do you either, do either you or Wayne have any comments about the Japanese decision making pro process at the Battle of Midway? Okay, uh, the Japanese in the Battle of Midway. So, yeah, I mean, this is if you, know, you got sort of two things going on, like we talk about strategy, we talk about forms of strategy, we talk about levels of strategy, I mean, just as, as means to, to better understand these things. So you know, I always say, you know, the, the, the government might have one idea in terms of what, what they want or how they want that to happen. And I think for the Japanese to think that they would succeed against the United States you know, it wouldn't be the complete destruction of our armed forces or anything like that, at least at the highest levels, but that the United States would lose its stomach for the fight very quickly um, if the military could deliver a, a, a decisive blow, which is, you know, Pearl Harbor had, had only recently become uh, the, the, the headquarters for the Pacific Fleet, so it was only there for a while. The Japanese referred to it as a, you know, dagger, you know, pointed at the heart of the empire, but um, it, it provided them with with an opportunity to, to strike a major blow, which you know, when we talk about a strategy of annihilation, the rapid destruction of your enemy's combat power, uh, Pearl Harbor and the concentration of the U.S. Pacific Fleet there, you know, gives the opportunity to the Japanese to, to, to succeed in that way. Uh, oftentimes people criticize the Japanese for not destroying the fuel farms or not destroying dry docks, not destroying, you know, other things, submarine forces and, and, and the like. But if your objective is the destruction of America's combat power, you want to destroy the battle line and you're hoping that you're going to destroy the two aircraft carriers that should have been there. Saratoga was on the, the west coast of the United States, but Lexington and Enterprise, uh, you know, should have been there or maybe you would anticipate that they're going to be there. 
So they fail in that, you know, and, and, and dealing a death blow at, at Pearl Harbor. They certainly did a tremendous amount of damage to the battle line, uh, but the carriers aren't there. And of course, the ability to, to sustain operations throughout 1942 on the fuel that's at Pearl Harbor, you know, that's there. But if, if you're still, you know, the United States is not stronger after December, December the 7th, it's weaker. Um, and so if you're the Japanese, the next operation that you design in order to accomplish your strategic objective is to try and lure the United States into a fight where you can destroy the remaining, uh, the remaining assets. Uh, and, and that would be the aircraft carriers. And at this point, uh, Lexington had been sunk in, in, at the beginning of May in, at the Battle of the Coral Sea. They thought Yorktown uh, was, was there with her. Uh, but Yorktown, of course, because the repair facilities at Pearl Harbor are still intact, Yorktown is going to show up uh, at, at Midway, as will uh, her sister ships Enterprise and Hornet. So, um, you know, for the Japanese, though, the, the idea is destroy that. And, and, and that would be the end of America's combat power in the Pacific. So that's, that's sort of the follow on logic. If, if the question is, you know, why, what were they thinking at, at, at Midway? Uh, they're thinking about completing the job that, that had not been completed in December of 1941. Um, there are also, I'd, I'd recommend Craig Simon's book on, on Midway. Uh, me personally, I think it's one of the, I, I think it's one of the finest books in, in all of military history. He writes well, it's very, uh, very well researched, very well reasoned, but, but Craig Simon's book on Midway is, is outstanding. Um, but yeah, the Japanese are trying to complete the job. Uh, obviously, it, it doesn't go the way that they had, had planned. They'd actually wargamed it, and, and the Americans uh, in the OB4 in the war game had, had put the Americans where they would be. This was disallowed. Uh, so uh, there's a great deal of optimism on the part of the Japanese, or arrogance, one might say. Um, but it's essentially trying to, to you know, think positively about completing the tasks that you had begun uh, and then failing miserably at it. Right. Um, Madeline has a comment and a question. <laughs> if all of you were to agree on one dumbest decision, which one would you all agree to? I want to write a paper in whichever one you deem the dumbest. Well, Madeline, historians never agree on anything. So I, I think it's nearly impossible. Um, I will say, though, I mean, at least in my, when we were all at West Point, Chuck was the contrarian. Chuck was the guy that did, did always wanted to be the devil's advocate and, and all this. But I will say that of all the things we've talked about right now, if you're looking to write a paper, I would agree that the Japanese decision to attack Pearl Harbor certainly has a wealth of different you know, ways you could approach that decision. There's tons of things, uh, resources out there on it. Um, it's still a question that, you know, a lot of people scratch their heads and ask, you know, geez, why did the Japanese really think that that was going to be a good idea? It's certainly so in that I'll, I'll side with the contrarian on that one and just say, yeah, Pearl and, Harbor. And, and can I add a comment on that? So, you know, part of the Japanese decision making context about Pearl Harbor is, is the United States has, has decided to cut off industrial exports to Japan mm -hmm. because the United States government is deeply unhappy with what the Japanese are doing in China. And so the Japanese are then going to basically launch this war in Southeast Asia to gain access to those industrial resources independently. The attack on Pearl Harbor is their preemptive assumption that the United States will militarily attempt to stop them, which is a colossal, when you think about miscalculation, right? you know, the United States' unhappiness with Japanese policy does not necessarily translate into it using the Philippines as a base to, to wage a, a, a war to interdict sea lanes of communication for the Japanese. But of course the Japanese then do the one thing that is going to guarantee American military opposition. And not only that, to, to make sure that military opposition has tremendous political support in the United States. And that is to launch a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. And it's sort of a, um, um, you know, for me, the counterfactual is what if the Japanese don't do that and just sort of dare the United States to, to do something to stop right their their campaigns in places like Southeast Asia and and my impression is I'm not a specialist in work too my impression is it's very questionable as to whether or not you would have actually had the political support mm -hmm. uh, in the United States um, and remember that even after Pearl Harbor you know you look at Rainbow Five I mean technically Europe first 
right? A lot of, you know, FDR in many ways is most concerned about Nazi Germany. Of course, the Pacific ends up getting a lot of resources, but uh, because of, of the political issue and the fact that the United, the United States is on such its back foot uh, early on. Uh, but the sort of, uh, the Japanese assumption, right? That of course the United States is gonna enter. So we've got to launch this, this massive preemptive strike to try to take the Americans off the table is sort of based on a sort of a series of, 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 of really questionable uh, assumptions in, in terms of the American political behavior and things like that. Yeah, now you bring up a great point. I was just talking the other day about how I, I think there's some merit to the idea that in a democracy like uh, the United States or Republic or whatever, in a democracy, um, in a lot of ways, you need to have a rallying cry in order to get the people to support your war. Uh, remember the Maine, uh, sinking of the Lusitania, remember Pearl Harbor, never forget. Um, 9-11, you know, you know, we shall never forget. We didn't have a rallying cry for Vietnam. We didn't, have, and, and that's where you find yourself kind of slipping into a war where the people really aren't even on board. But it, what, you know, so you, you propose a wonderful what if. What if there wasn't that rallying cry of Pearl Harbor? And, and what if they had just not? So it's, it's pretty fascinating to, to think in those terms. Uh, Jim Treaser's just asking about McClellan. I mean, oh man, the, 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 the punching bag, the proverbial punching bag of, of the Civil War. And, I will have you guys know that when I went through my list of worst American generals of all time, I did not include uh, McClellan. I figured that he had had enough. There's no, no point in, in beating that dead horse. And I tried to go with some names that people might not have, have been as, as familiar with. So um, he's talking about the McClellan, McClellan on the peninsula in 1862. Um, you know, I, you know, just, Hey, he was flexing his case of the slows, as uh, Lincoln likes to say. Um, you could certainly uh, accuse him of, of just not being aggressive enough and uh, allowing uh, Lee at the seven days to you know, start throwing haymakers and, and getting worried about all that and, and backing off when he had full advantage of the situation. But um, can, can I play contrarian here a bit? Go ahead, please. Yeah, so I, I will, I think the, the peninsula is a great line of operation that McClellan chooses. And I think in many ways, the overland campaign vindicates that. He's using federal sea, you know, superiority at sea. Uh, his goal is to besiege uh, the Confederate army def defending Richmond. And Robert e. Lee, e. Lee, as early as, as, as 62, knows that the moment he is pocketed in a siege, he is done. And that's essentially how he loses the war. Uh, now, McClellan ends up being, at the tactical and operational level, a deeply flawed commander. So that ends up being his inability to kind of uh, fulfill the promise of that line of operation. I will say, though, one final thing to defend McClellan. If Joseph E. Johnston does not get wounded, right, uh, you, know, I, you know, I think it is probable that he, you know, if we look at his style of generalship, he would have sort of cautiously attempted to defend that line. He would have had to fall back. He would have eventually been invested and he would have eventually failed. Um, and instead, what, 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 you know, because of that artillery, you know, shrapnel, right? Uh, McClellan then faces probably the commander who is most ideally suited to match up and exploit McClellan's, I think it's fair to say, excessive caution, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and McClellan basically loses his nerve, right? And people remember, the seven days, Lee does not achieve what he wants in the seven days. He wants to destroy the Army of Potomac. And for a variety of reasons, Stonewall Jackson has kind of some, an off campaign. He isn't able to do that. Uh, but McClellan basically, you know, McClellan could have, should have just stayed, but he doesn't. And, and, and he also loses political support in DC. So, I, I mean, I think the peninsula is a great line of operation. It's just that McClellan's own kind of, uh, you know, operational kind of flaws, basically kind of compromise, and plus, you know, quite frankly, some bad luck. And, and that's the other thing that hasn't shown up here is, um, you know, Chuck's references to, to Halsey, Halsey gets lucky. <laughs> he gets lucky that those, those destroyers and those carrier escorts decide to fight to the death, right? And, and that, you know, that's, that's his good fortune. And, and that's, you know, part of what, what kind of feeds into a lot of these assessments is who is lucky and who's not. All right. Well, I, my phone is going off in the background, but we'll ignore that. It is not important. Um, but, and this is the point in the program, we're, we're wrapping it up, but this is the point in the program where I, I plug a book, not only Chuck's book. Uh, Chuck, remind everybody what the title of the book is. Yeah, it, History's Worst Military Leaders. It's uh, 
Fantastic. In the U.S., it's being in the U.S. I think it's being distributed by uh, the University of Chicago Press, but uh, the publisher was in the U.K. was Reaction Press. It's got a nice review in the Times of London, which you know. Nice. All right. Hey, having lived over there for a while, that makes me feel yeah. good. So, in addition to Chuck's book, um, I would encourage people that are interested in bad decisions. Um, particularly in the American experience, to check out a book called America's First Battles, uh, an edited volume, Heller and Stoft. And I, it's, it's replete with a number of chapters, examples throughout American history of first battles that did not go well. Because if you see in the American experience, usually a, a first battle does not go well in the American experience. But it's largely due to ignorance, um, just as much as bad decisions. It's just they, they don't know what they don't know, and they haven't done this before, but they quickly figure it out. That kind of being the underlying premise of the book is that Americans have a habit of starting cold, but then figuring it out and, and you know, getting it right uh, later on. But uh, I would encourage people to, to check out that book if you're interested in kind of like things going wrong, poor decisions, but then, you know, kind of the Mer American habit of figuring it out as we go. Um, all right. So with that, uh, I want to thank everybody that tuned in today. Um, oh, and good. Uh, in our chat, uh, Kendall has put a, the link to Chuck's book right there. So everybody can go check out that link. And she just threw in America's First Battles link too. Kendall, thank you very much. You are very quick with that. Um, so thank you to everybody for tuning in. Before we go, though, I want to um, uh, remind everybody about, uh, about our upcoming Live streams and next week we have our salute to service, the Army Dental Corps. How many times have you heard or watched a program about Army Dental Corps? Probably never. So this will be your maybe only chance you will ever have to hear the story from Army dentists um, who've had to fix some very jacked up teeth along the way. I'm sure of that. So check in and see um, what our two uh, Army dentists have to say about their time in service. That should be really good. And then our next Popcorn Thursday next month is That's Gross, the Worst Military Cuisine. Uh, with that, we are, I'm going to bring in a panel of, like I, as I like to say, some seasoned veterans. Aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. And they're just going to tell me their stories of how bad military food can be. And I'm going to try and mix it up with the Vietnam era and uh, maybe Cold War type era. And, and then more the more recent, we can compare the really bad stuff that we've had to force down our mouths in, in service in different areas, everything from potted meat to uh, dysentery, all that good stuff. So um, <clears throat> with that, uh, Wayne and Chuck, we really appreciate your time uh, spending it with us. Uh, thanks very much. We'll definitely, we'll have you back again. This is fun and you guys are great. So appreciate your insight and your stories and everything like that. Um, enjoy. And Wayne, enjoy Annapolis, and Chuck, enjoy uh, Hawaii for the rest of the time that you are there. And uh, everyone, thanks for joining in again tonight, and we will see you in a future live stream program. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.